Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. Miss Becky, thank you so much for coming on thank the you. podcast. I, we spent six weeks together off and on we did. during this trial. I was there every day. And um, now you ran for office for Clicker Court in 2020? I did. And then you were you took office in January 2021. That's right. Could you have ever imagined <laughs> what was to come? No. With your no, career? No. Yeah. Ha- have things settled down? Da- other than the book, have things settled down? In Colleton County. Well, I will tell you, the tours coming to Colleton County Courthouse, we never imagined that. And we have tours coming every day that we're open. The bailiffs are giving tours. Oh, wow. We're up to like, you know, 10 or 15 a day. Whoa. That's amazing. You know, what's crazy is the one thing I do want to say is that like media spectators, everybody loved you during this trial because you were like the dynamic person who always had the answer, no matter if it was a spectator or an employee. And then the other thing I want to touch on too is just the staff in that courthouse, the bailiffs, the people that work the front. Yeah. You guys have such a special yeah. crew there and they really made everybody feel like family. We do. Love that you wrote this book. It's such a unique perspective. Thank you. But what made you decide to do this, to write this book? Well, there's people that have said that a clerk of court has never written a book. And I have said back, well, why not? Well, this was has been called the trial of the century. And this is so big and so huge. It needs to be told. There's so many things that went on behind the scenes. And that's what this book is mainly about. Um, What went on behind the scenes of the doors of justice Mm -hmm. through the Alec Murdoch trial and so many other stories that just stem from that. I've never seen so many people interested in a trial like they were this one. Me it, either, Gigi. And you've seen more than I have. But I'll tell you, my brother, who does not do true crime, lives across the street. So mm-hmm. I would come home on the weekends after trial. Anytime he saw me out, he would wave me down. Come here. We got to talk about Murdoch. People that normally didn't watch things like this, it grabbed them, them, oh, their attention. Did you ever think it would become as big as it did outside of South Carolina? I did not. Yeah. I did not. We had one journalist there who was an independent. I forget where he was from. He was from overseas. I know. There was Fr- there was a French man. French. And yes. by the end of it, he was couch yes. surfing. He was. In Walter Burrow. He just, was. Just to stay. He came to my home to cook <laughs> supper for us. He, he became such a good friend. Your day-to-day operations are pretty uniform and in, in how they go, they but are. then it's a slow, lazy town. Even though we right. have crime and murder, oh, of course, and things that go on. Now you have a bit of a family connection way back with the Murdochs. Your your um your granddaddy, yes, back in his day, him Buster Junior. Yes, now, Buster, old Buster. Old Buster. Oh, yes. They were kind of neighbors and business partners. They were. They were friends, and they were really good friends in the, in the moonshine-making business that went on in the 1950s. Mm. And in 1956, they're the best uh, moonshine still that I've heard was the Mac Daddy of all moonshine stills got busted. And um, there was an arrest made. There were some indictments that went down. But no one went to jail um, oh, wow. in that little circle. Growing up in Walterboro or in the area, did you ever hear these tales about the Murdoch family? Oh, um, I just, did. Yeah, I a did. lot of. And they were always around. And um, and then finally, when I got to meet them, uh, when I was a court reporter, you know, it was all true to to what I had heard. They were bigger than than life. Mm-hmm. Um, Mr. Randolph Murdoch, Buster Murdoch, I got to meet, I know him too. And they were just charming and they mm-hmm. were good at making you feel so at home and welcome in that circle. That was one thing I noticed about Alec during the trial is from the people that opened the door to the bailiffs, to court staff, he was polite. He was charming. He was. Um, you know, and so you do see that side of him that comes very natural. I think that'll mm-hmm. serve him well in prison. I do. I think I do. he'll thrive. Yes. Um, do, is that what you think? Do you think I he do. Will I think he'll have his own kingdom yep. in, in the prison territory. I think so, too. So... What was your gut about the boat crash initially? Did you think that this would be swept under the rug when you found out that it was Paul Murdoch? Good question. I did. Mm -hmm. I did. But, you know, there was just something um, bigger with this, with Mallory. It it uncovered so many things. It was like the Pandora's box unearthed, and It, it just opened up. 
And it really put a spotlight on Alec. Were you at Paul's arraignment when he was arraigned for that? I wasn't there, but I watched it on TV. Did you? Okay. Yeah. And and in your book, you talk about that footage, watching that footage from the hospital that night where Randolph and Alec get there very quickly. I think it was within 10 minutes. In Mm -hmm. fact, I think they may have beat Mm -hmm. Paul there. Mm -hmm. And then you see him going from room to room. And I've always heard Randolph was a a nice man. Oh, yes. But, you know, then you hear this comment where he says um, that she's gone. There's nothing we can do about it. Do you think that night when they realize the enormity, you've got kids in hospital rooms, you've got one that's missing. Mm-hmm. Do you think at that moment, Randolph knew, like, this is the biggest thing to happen to this family and we I have do. got to get a grip on it? Absolutely. Yeah. They had to get their story. You knew the Murdochs in a professional capacity before yes, this. Right. When you first heard about Paul and Maggie being murdered, what, what was the first thing you thought? What went through your mind? The first thing I thought, and I told my friend who called me at 1030 that night, well, where is Alec? Where is mm-hmm. Buster? Yeah. Are they safe? Because I thought whoever was out there uh, would be looking for them. Mm-hmm. It was my understanding that Alec was not there when it happened. Right. And Buster, I had heard, was coming down from upstate. And my thought was, uh, they need to be protected. Did you think early on it could have been Alec? Or at what point did you think, wow, this could be him? The next day, when we heard the the message go out from law enforcement that the public was safe. Exactly. That gut feeling, that woman's intuition. I had the same thought. I never really thought this was related to the boat crash, though. I did not either. It was People still thought. morning, too. I mean, yeah. this was not a you know a vindictive vendetta. No, no. no. I, thought, I thought more of a drug connection because I'd always heard rumors about the drug. Drug connection. The drug right. running. I thought somebody's, right. he owes a debt or something. That, that was, was the more believable thing. It really was. Yeah. Now, you went to Paul and Maggie's funeral. I did. Alec was at the funeral. He was. And was he emotional? Was he crying? Was he not what? at all? Not no. at all. He was trying. He was meeting people. He was mm-hmm. shaking hands. He was making sure uh, everybody else was okay. He was talking to everybody else. Mm-hmm. Just you know, going around and and just talking. You know, now looking back, you attended that. You saw him there. Is mm-hmm. it weird to think now he did this? Well, and I'll tell you because for so long, a year and a half, we had heard he wasn't there. Mm-hmm. He's that's the one story he stuck to. He wasn't there. Right. He wasn't there. And then the very first thing that we heard in the trial, the bombshell that put silence throughout the whole nation, was when that video was played. That and we was... heard his voice. And then he admitted, yes, I was there. I'd heard of the Snapchat before trial. I knew that they did have a Snapchat from that night. And what always struck me as odd is you watch them on that and you listen. Mm. And even with the Kennel video... Mm-hmm. It's normal. You don't hear oh, yes. any sense with Murdoch that there's something wrong, that he's stressed, no, he's thinking about right. something. There's no squabble. There's no fighting. Nothing. Right. Paul's laughing. He's giggling. Yes. Was that the big aha moment for you? Was that kennel video? It was. Yeah. It was huge. Oh, yeah. It yes. Was, it was big. And you didn't know about that before trial? I did not. Oh. There was a huge... I remember in the courtroom, there was a huge gasp throughout the whole... And I, I could just hear it going throughout the whole nation as everybody was, was hearing that for the first time in their living rooms or wherever they were. You said in your book that every morning before trial, Alec would greet you. He would. How did that How did that feel? Because you, you knew him when things were normal. Yes, yes. And now he is the defendant and It was so surreal. I mean, it was almost like he was coming in as an attorney and mm-hmm. saying, good morning, Miss Becky. But mm-hmm. here he was a defendant and it was, it was different. Were you worried you guys would not get a fair jury in Walterboro with the Murdochs having that stronghold for over almost 100 years, 80-something years? Did you guys ever think this would be sent to another, another city, a bigger city in South Carolina? There's always that possibility, but I have to tell you that I, I remained open-minded. I, I know that there's an influx of people from the North that have come down to live here in the South. Mm-hmm. I knew that there would be people who, who had just gotten to uh, voting age and their names would be put on the, the roll to be called as a juror. So that would be a younger generation. So I knew that there would be quite a, a good population that may not even know the Murdochs. And I will tell you, we had three jurors on our jury that did not know the Murdoch name. We had two major documentaries out about the case. Yes. It was all over news day and night, yes. you know, leading up to the trial. Now, do you agree with the state's theory of the murders that it was a pressure cooker and that he wanted to buy time? Well, partly. 
Yeah. I think partly. He was under a lot of pressure. And you have to wonder, you know, what happened in between those few minutes where they're laughing and and, and talking about the dog having the chicken or the guinea or whatever it was to a double murder. Right. You know, we'll never know. We won't. So as far as the Murdoch family, is it Nettie that was there? Was that, are you talking about victim's advocate uh, Uh, deputy? She she had the shaved head. Ned Grant. Nat Grant. I love her so much. She is phenomenal. She was made for times like this. She really was. And watching her with that family, how delicate she was, they were all so kind. I spoke to each of the Murdochs at some point during the trial. It was hard to watch them, especially John Marvin. You could tell that bond he had with Paul. Yes, he did. Were you surprised that Buster was there every day? I was not surprised. I, I figured that he would be. Yes. Um, now, John Marvin, I have to say, he is a very um, noble man, and I've gotten to know him recently in the past few years, and he did love his nephews, both of them, and he's just been a very kind, charming man uh, in every instance that I have met with him. I agree. Total sweetheart. Randy, too. Randy, as well. Yeah. Randy's a little bit more reserved. So you yes. heard that Alec had been practicing his crying and snot blowing before trial? I did hear that. Cool. Yes. Yes. Well, he was good at it, so he, he must have practiced, it, yeah. and um, he did it very well, much to the jury's chagrin. Oh, yeah. Didn't one juror like, kind of pass the tissues to Jim Griffin, I, I think? I believe so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Clean it up, please. Yeah. And, and speaking of Buster, you talk about swearing Buster in before he testified, which I, I thought he did a great job on the stand. You I know, did, too. Under what pressure he had. And you said you were trying to find something off with him, but you just couldn't. I couldn't. No. Yeah. No. Was there any point that you thought Alec came off as authentic on the stand? No. No. Never. No. Yeah. You never felt like he was telling the truth about anything up there. I really don't. And he had such a hard time answering questions that I would get very frustrated and have to get up and walk out of the courtroom. (laughs) Uh, It's just uh, unbelievable the way that he couldn't answer a question. And I know there was a big fight about putting him on the stand. Yes. But it came down to him. It did. So It did. That's the rights that he has. But I think he had to. After that kennel video, and Mm -hmm. then you get every person on that stand, and they say, do you recognize those voices? They read it off. Alec Murdoch. Yes. He had nothing to lose to get on that stand. Exactly. But financial Mm -hmm. stuff is pretty solid. There were not a lot of ways to wiggle out of the financial stuff he had done. The murders, you always have a jury where they can say, well, there's reasonable doubt. But you think that visit to Moselle really sealed the deal for some of those jurors. Oh, I do. That was like a, the missing piece of a jigsaw puzzle or the last piece finally being put into place. That was it, I think, for all of us. It and was heavy. The distance between where Maggie and Paul were when they were shot, when they were oh, found, was it a long distance between them? No. No? Maybe just a little bit more than me and you, between oh, wow. me and you. Oh, okay. Not far at all. Because, you know, it's hard to tell in the pictures when they point out where, where they were found. And, you know, during the trial, uh, most of us had thought, from what we heard, that she was running away from the scene, but that wasn't true. Mm-mm. She was actually running towards her son. Now, before the Murdoch trial, had you ever been in a trial with Dr. Kinsey? No. No. First okay. time. Yeah. Impressed. Oh my gosh. To say the least. I've watched his testimony probably five times. Have you? Yeah. Just because it's so well done. And it and it's yeah, he I would I would go to any class he taught. Um, and it's almost like you can't rock him. You, you just can't. He's and, so solid. And when they had their the defense had their witness, you know, saying that it could be over here, and he is in a very nice southern gentleman way, says mm-hmm. that's not the case. That you is know. so true. And then he went back and re explained it. And that jury, that witness, Dr. Kinsey, was they did not take their eyes off of him. Yeah. They were transfixed because he used the visuals. Too. Right. When he used the dowel to show the angle. Yeah. Let's move on to the side of the road. Okay. What did you think when you heard he had been shot in the head? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I can still remember hearing that that day and where I was. And it was like, oh, my gosh. This is such a lie. Well, first of all, he's not going to stop, and he's not going to change his own flat tire. And then the, the story about someone coming and shooting him was a little preposterous. Good. Labor Day weekend. How close were we to getting Cousin Eddie on the stand? Very. Really? That's what I thought. Very close. Yeah. Oh. Well, his name was on the witness list. Yeah, 250 that they had. But <laughs> they did. That yes. was every day we would yes. say, you hear anything about Cousin oh, Eddie? Oh, we were all anticipating Cousin Eddie. But man, but, what that man knows. Yes, yes, You yes, have yes. to wonder. Maybe he'll write a book. Shelly Smith, the caregiver. You know, and for her to get on the stand with Alec looking at her mm-hmm. and saying he was carrying a blue raincoat yes. that ended up being covered in, in gunpowder. Right, right. Man, you know, you could see the 
fear, not the fear. I think it was more of maybe she felt like she was betraying the family yes. and doing what she had to That's do. That's a good way to put it. Right. Yeah. Is she still with Miss Libby, do you know? Or? It's my understanding that she's not, but okay. I think she, she left on her own accord. Yeah. So. That's understandable. Yes. So I was thinking about the bomb threat. That had to come on the hottest day of the trial so far. I believe it was. It was, two hours. <laughs> I was out running around on the phone. And did you see the video of when Jim Griffin whispered to Alec, it was a bomb threat. Did you ever see the video of that little smirk on his face? I did not. Oh, I'll have to show it to you at dinner. <laughs> that was also the time when the book was passed up by his sister, by Alex's sister. Oh, yeah. All of that happened on the same day. Was that? Yes. Interesting. Yes. Did any of the prospective jurors know the Murdochs? Did you ever run into that problem with, with the prospective jurors? This was such a quick... Jury selection, by the way, two oh, days. it was. And it was something that Judge Newman predicted. Really? He knew that it was going to go smooth. I don't know how. I guess just his wisdom um, yeah. and just his doing it for so many years. I kind of thought myself and some of my staff, it would take at least a week. That's what, I, that's what we were kind of planning on there was, was a no week. no way it was going to be done yeah. in two days like he thought. And yeah. here it was. Amazingly. Yeah, it was amazing. And Judge Newman, I just want to hug his neck. You know, right after verdict and sentencing, March Madness was here in Greenville. Yes. So he came up to support the Gamecocks. Oh, yes. I had more That's friends. His passion. Oh, I can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have more friends on my Facebook feed with selfies with Judge Newman. <laughs> and I thought, what's it like going? Because, you know, you're doing your job every day and then this case comes through your courtroom. Oh, now you guys are our true crime celebrities. Everybody knows in the true crime world knows you, Judge Newman, Creighton Waters, Alan Wilson. Oh, yes. Has Do you get yes. recognized when you go places? I do. Yeah. I do. Is it weird? It is. It, it is, is weird, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> You know, I think the thing, too, though, is the book is such an amazing way for people that were so passionate about the trial to get that little bit extra that you didn't know about. I do, too. Yeah. Behind the Doors of Justice. Oh. um, The title just was easy to come to me. And then uh, just the things that happened behind the doors of justice, that trial of the century. Yeah. This was worldwide. This was bigger than OJ. Nice. This was bigger than uh, Susan Smith that happened in the 90s. It was bigger than Slager. Mm-hmm. It was huge. It was huge. And you never would have thought no. <laughs> you'd be sitting in their front row for that. Not at all. I remember I was talking to you and some of the other media, and y'all told me that, um, all right, Becky, be prepared. This is going to be... Uh, from people coming from all over the world. And I was like, really? Yeah, I really? remember you were like, no way. No, no, no. And people will be camping out on your front lawn. There's going to be lines um, early morning. And I thought, gosh, well, okay. Well, we need to get, we need to have a plan. We need yeah. to be ready for this. Yeah. Oh, I knew it was coming. And then when yeah. word on the street kind of started going around that he was going to testify, yes. that line wrapped around the building. Because oh, yes. that was what everybody wanted to see. You yeah. know, what's what's he going to do? Is he going to admit? Exactly. Will he say something? He didn't admit nothing. He didn't. Not <laughs> he at wasted all. two days. He did. I think at, for the most part, the media and the spectators were respectful of the process. But they we were. did have a couple of days where people were sort of treating it like a live reality show. Mm-hmm. People were audible whenever mm-hmm. there was an objection by the defense and it was overruled. Right. It was kind of like, yes. And right. he had to address that. And Judge but Newman did a very fine job with that. He was very classy. Ma- was there any issue that sticks out to you as far as something a member of the press or a, a spectator did? I remember one lady coming in in really, really tight leather pants, and she kept looking at Murdoch, and I'm like, she's mm. one of those. Mm. Oh, yeah, she was trying to get his attention. But was there anything that happened that and stuck out to you where you guys just had to address something with somebody and just get firm, or, or was it really just smooth? We did have a few instances. We had a hometown woman who had moved away, but she had come back for the trial. And she was very, very ugly to my bailiff, Paul Paul Bennett. And we had to put her on a probation status and tell her not to come back in because I was not going to allow that in the courtroom. That was over a ticket, wasn't it? Uh, to get in? That one was actually just over a seat in the courtroom. Uh, Paul said, no, when you come in, you, you know, you'll sit where I tell you to sit because that's my job. And you don't have the same seat every time you come in. And she got very, very ugly with him. I, I remember that. I think I, I saw her downstairs. She said it in front of a lot of people. What do you think was the most powerful moment of the tr- Well, we said the kennel video. You think mm. that was the moment where... That was one of them. Yeah. Well, I thought John Metters, when he did his... His examination of his witnesses that he did. Mm-hmm. He was such a good attorney in in his interaction. All of them were good. But John just had a special way of how he could 
interact with the witnesses that he talked to mm-hmm. and just pull out the information so effortlessly. Um, I would say he was one, but um, I'd also say David Owen, who was the lead investigator for SLED. He was so good. He's a sweetheart. He lost his he mom, did. right? He did lose uh, his like mom. Like the day before he testified. He did, yes. Yeah. And then you watch some of his old partners testify, and one that stuck out to me was Ronnie Crosby. Oh, yes. He's devastated. You see how hurt you do. These coworkers are. Jean Seconder let it fly. Mm-hmm. I mean, she did. She did. I don't want to mess with her. She did not mince words, no. and I would not want to make her mad. No. When we get to verdict, we were having the media party across the street. Mm-hmm. Your daughter, who has an amazing voice, oh, was singing you. her heart out. Thank Gorgeous, you. sweet, very talented. I ran over to get my camera guy to come get some barbecue, smoking butts. Who yes. are my buddies. Yes. I keep in touch with them. I'm craving some mac and cheese right now. Oh, J.J. Lamb. That's oh, right. they're so good. <laughs> but I remember Nancy Grace running out of the courthouse saying, guys, guys. And then she starts putting makeup on. And I run back over to the media center. I'm like, dude, we got a verdict or something. Yes. And so we were sitting there. And then everybody was like, maybe a question. And then the rumor mill starts. Well, I heard yeah. they didn't need dinner because mm-hmm. they were going to get the, they thought they would finish up. Was right. that something that you heard? That they that were close. Is, I was the one. Well, I always go and check with the jury if it's around supper time. And I did what I usually normally do. And I went and checked with our bailiff, Bill Polk. And he went to go check with the four lady. And that's what he came back and told me that she said. I said, okay. And that was, it wasn't long after that. It was not long and ago. it happened so fast. So when you were reading that verdict, I mean, I can't imagine knowing that the world was watching you. Yes. You did an amazing job, by the way. Thank you. Thank um, you. But Alec was staring at you. He was. How did that make you feel? Mm. Inside, very nervous. Yes. He wanted to hear what the verdict was. Yeah. But I have to tell you this story. So I've been a court reporter for many years. I've been a clerk of court for a few years. And when, we, when a verdict is read, it's usually on a verdict form mm-hmm. that has been prepared by the law clerk at the judge's instruction, and you have certain questions, and then you have check marks, guilty or not guilty. So it's all prepared. We know what to read. It's right there. Mm -hmm. So in this particular instance, that's just something that Judge Newman and I never discussed, the ending of the trial. So he gave me the indictments, the actual indictments that were handed over to the jury about Alec. There was no verdict form. Wow. No verdict form. So I look up at him, and you'll notice I go back to him, and I look up at him, and I say, Judge Newman, is there, a, is there a verdict for him? He'll say, no, these are the indictments that you need to read from. You're just going to read from top to bottom. Wow. Well, in my mind, I knew that um, I'd never read this before off of, off of a, um, an indictment, and I knew that I needed to read every word. I didn't want to miss anything. So that's why I could feel the eyes of Alec on me. Um, I probably read too many words and too many numbers, but I needed to get it all in there. So after the first one, here came the others, you know. Are you slated to be in there for any upcoming stuff? If anything comes through that courthouse, you'll be in there? I would imagine so. You'll just uh, same person. We have some financial crimes, I'm Mm -hmm. sure, that will come to our courthouse. Yeah, you you think he'll take them to court? I would imagine. Yeah. I've heard he's trying to hammer out this plea deal with the feds, but there's, I mean, we've got 99, 100 indictments. I mean, we'll be trying these cases till Jesus comes back. (laughs) You know, if there's one truth you could find out about any of this, what would it be? Mm, Gosh. Because I have so many. Well, why? Why? You don't you didn't have to do this, did you? I wouldn't think so. I mean, taking an, another life, especially your family. Your son. That you Why? were an hour before laughing with and giggling with. It right. just that's it's so heartbreaking. Paul never saw it coming. But I think in some ways it's poetic. In death, Paul led uh, that jury to his killer. Oh, uh, he did. With that video. He did. And was that very last minute that that was found and provided, or was that something, do you know if that's something they had for I a while? I believe that I remember that it, they didn't really unlock Paul's phone until 2022, right. and so it was very recent that that, that had happened. Um, and I will tell you this, and this again is from David Owen, who shared this with me, and I have to tell you this, uh, in the place that Maggie lay and in the place that Paul lay, the grass never grew back in that area. Grass had been cut many times. But instead, in Maggie's place, grew white flowers. In Paul's place, grew red flowers. Oh, wow. No grass. 
kind of gives you chills. Yeah, I've got chills right now. To hear that. Yeah, and then you went to the property view, and then you see that bullet hole still in that window pane. Oh, yes. You know, I think things like that made it very real. It did. And we talked about this in the beginning, but you, you think he will do well in prison. I think he's resolved. I think he will. Do you think this will be a thing where every few years we're going to find a new crime pop up that that mm. he was involved in? I would think highly likely. Yeah, I think so too. Sure. Well, I appreciate you doing this with me. I I mean, you know, we got to know each other over the six we weeks. Did. And, yeah. and it's, you know, what was really, really neat is the media is that everybody flowed and we all supported each other and nobody mm-hmm. had an ego. And No, not and, at all. And, you know, we had your birthday party. We did. At Valerie Bauer line, right. And right. just, the, I have to say, some of the nicest, other than the, the Valo Daybell trial, which a lot of us have connected for years, mm. this was the greatest group of media mm-hmm. assembled. Everybody was just there for justice and facts and mm-hmm. to celebrate your birthday one random <laughs> night and media parties from Joe McCullough and everything yes, else. But yes. you did an amazing job. You Thank held you. that courtroom down and it ran so smooth. I'm excited to promote this book. I think um, I, I bet three quarters of my listeners have inboxed me. I bought it. It's wow. on my Kindle. Wow. I hope it does well for you because it is, oh. if anybody followed this trial, yes, this is definitely like the must have follow up oh. to, I think, to get the full picture. And, and what you included in there was things that people want to know. So mm-hmm. you did a great job. Mm-hmm. And that story with the flowers, man, that one's going to oh. stick with me. I mean, it's in the book. It is in the book. Think you're going to write any other books? I would love to. You go, girl. Yes. Yeah, because you did a good job on number one. So. Thank you. Well, I'm going to see some more. All Appreciate right, Miss Becky, thank you so much. Best of luck to you if I'm ever in Walterboro. I'm going to come for a tour. I would hope you would. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. All right. Mm-hmm.